Much? All right, well, this is a little awkward, isn't it? Like a first date? Always awkward. I don't know whether to hold your hand, give you a hug when we say goodbye. I don't know. It's weird. So uh, I will try to not embarrass your pastor or my pastor. And I want to glorify Jesus. Other than that, tonight I don't have any agenda. I believe, I believe that the Word of God speaks for itself. And if we take a careful look at it tonight, and we're cautious to put it in its right uh, uh, interpretation and make good application to it, I think it changes lives. And so we're going to do that tonight out of the book of Numbers. You say, how are you going to get to missions out of the book of Numbers? I have no idea yet. No, I do. I've, I've, I've been here before. Um, I believe if I could only speak one time on the subject of missions, this is where I'm going to go to. It's just what God put in my heart about 10 years ago. I was sitting in a hotel lobby just asking God for something for a conference that I was in. And, uh, man, God, he drove this home to me. And tonight I want to be able to approach missions as, as a whole subject, not just giving, because giving is a great part of missions, but it's not necessarily enough. Because if we just give financially, we still have a lot of other issues we have to overcome in missions. And so tonight, we're going to take kind of a, a holistic approach to missions, and we'll try to try to not complicate the subject. But when we look at the scripture tonight, and you start to see where we're going, I think you'll understand it. So be patient tonight as we kind of lay this foundation and see what the Lord is going to say. Numbers chapter 32 and we will lay the context. I believe context is extremely important in Scripture. We'll lay the context, and it takes a few minutes to get there. So if you look in verse number 1 of Numbers chapter 32, you'll see the children of Israel have now approached, um, they have approached on the east bank of the Jordan River. As they look at this east bank, and they're preparing for the crossing that's going to come, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh are introduced here as the three tribes that long to stay on the east side. So if you're looking at the nation of Israel, and uh, Jordan River is the border, the current border of, of Israel. It, it separates Israel from Jordan. They're on the Jordan side of the Jordan River. It says in verse number one, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle, and when they saw the land of Jazor, the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came, and they spake unto Moses and Eleazar the priest, and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth and Dibon and Jazor and Nimrah and Heshbon and Elilah and Shabam and Nebo and Beon, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto the servants, thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? Let's ask the Lord's help tonight as we go into the Word of God here. Father, we are grateful tonight to be able to stand here and to proclaim the Word of God. Certainly not worthy, God, humble tonight, Lord, to be in this church, to know their heart for missions, to know some of the missionaries already who are here, to know their great need. And Lord, some of that need and, and some of the, the burden of this church is financial, and we certainly, tonight, we cannot talk about missions without talking about that financial need. But Lord, that may be just the tip of the iceberg, and there may be something very much more that you want to do in this place tonight. I believe that there is. And so, God, I pray that you would give us tonight understanding as we look at this word, that we would see it as it was written for the purpose it was written for, that, that contest and interpretation. But then, God, we would see that there is a, a greater message here. And, Lord, tonight I pray that you would change the world in the next few moments. Lord, I know that that's a great request that is certainly not a request based upon my ability or performance, but, Father, trusting tonight that the Holy Spirit of God is present in this place. That, Lord, you as the creator of man are also the master of man. 
And God, as we have submitted ourselves to you tonight to come to this place and to subject ourselves to the Word of God, and we've asked you, Lord, as we pray today to speak to us, then, Father, we are willing to obey as you speak. And so, Lord, tonight, nothing less than an absolutely changed world would satisfy you. God, help us tonight. Lord, it was said of the early apostles, Lord, the disciples, that they turned the world upside down. Give us that movement again, not for our sakes, God, but for the sake of the lost and for the glory of Christ. God, if need be, erase our names from the history of it, God, as you have maybe done with so many others. Lord, so that the glory might rest upon Christ alone. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we see the context of our scripture here, obviously the context is war. We'll make application to that war because you and I are in a war tonight. Whether you like to admit it tonight, no one's really safe. The enemy, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Friend, our, our neighbors, relatives, loved ones, those who are across the world, distant lands that we don't even know, are at uh, risk tonight of being preyed upon by the enemy. And in fact, we know according to the scripture that those who are without Christ will spend eternity in hell. That is the war that we're engaging in tonight. And so this is not just a plea for more money, although that plea will certainly be made. This is a plea for those to take up their armor and to submit themselves to the battle and to participate in what's happening here. And I'm afraid tonight, friend, as we sit in an auditorium like this, it's really easy to look at the missionaries and say, hell, those guys are at war. And for us to step back out of the war. First of all, tonight, let's just lay a little bit of foundation. The problem that we're still suffering from tonight is the fall. Genesis chapter number 3, when man fell there in the Garden of Eden, there was like a domino effect that took place. All men are now fallen. Fallen because of their nature, fallen by their choice, but fallen no matter. And so what we see tonight, we live in a lost world. It's a chaotic world. It's a world where sin seems to reign, where Satan is the god of this place, and where men are condemned to die. But we have a solution to that problem, and that solution is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I could tonight just pick any subject in the Bible and say that is my subject that I'll preach, it would be the gospel. I would start in Isaiah chapter 53. I would run to 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I would jump over to John chapter number 3. You must be born again. I would preach tonight the gospel because I love to preach the gospel because it is the answer and the only answer for fallen men. So God has showed us the war, the fall has corrupted mankind, and God has showed us our greatest instrument of war. That's the gospel. So here we are in the midst of a war where we understand who the enemy is and what his objective is to damn men and we have been granted the the weapon the gospel of jesus christ to be able to confront the enemy here's the problem this is all just for free because this is not even in the context here's the problem we have not taken up the responsibility The fact that you and I tonight are saved and are at peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have comfort, that we have a promised home in heaven, that we have rest in our soul, we have been unprovoked and unwilling to bring the gospel message to the rest of the world. We don't preach the gospel. Can I tell you something? The gospel does work. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God, right, unto salvation. Romans chapter number 1, Corinthians chapter number 1 says something like this, that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Notice that the gospel is always referred to as being powerful. It always works. You say, well, Brother Matt, I tried the gospel one time and it didn't work. Well, you didn't try it enough because if you keep trying it, it will work. Have you ever noticed that some preachers have more people saved than other preachers? Some of it is gifting. Some of it is the ground that they're sowing in. Some of it is some people just keep preaching the gospel. They just keep preaching it. And the disciples had to learn that, that often that they shook the dust off their feet and they just kept preaching the gospel. I promise you the gospel works. So if the fall and the, the ruin of man is the issue that we have and the gospel is the solution, then the Great Commission is the strategy that you and I have 
to be able to reach the lost. The Great Commission was given to us in Acts chapter number 1, verse number 8, that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the, what? Uttermost. That's given to us geographically. So if we had a map, I see a map of, I see one map. I see the map of Israel, all right? So if we had a map of the world, we would divide the world into geographical sections. And Jesus said every geographical place, the uttermost, the furthest and final place, needs the gospel. Every place. So strategically, we can look at the flags and the countries and say, okay, every place needs a preacher. But Jesus didn't stop there. Matthew chapter number 28, he says this, that we need to, uh, he said, all power is given unto me. And then he says this in, in the next verse. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So nations are not geographical. The word nation there is ethnos, that's people groups. There are 16,000 people groups in the world. That means they have their own culture, their, their own history, they share languages. So if you think about a country like maybe Pakistan, you'll see that's one nation, one country. No, 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 no. It's one country according to the United Nations, according to us, according to their president, but culturally, there's 400 nations inside of Pakistan. So I don't understand. Well, think about out west. When you go out west and you come to the Crow Nation, then you come to, to the Blackfoot, then you come to the Cheyenne, then you come to all of the different nations, their own distinct culture. 16,000 nations in the world tonight, 6,000 of them remain classified as unreached. So this is the war we're participating in. The gospel must go to every place. That's the uttermost. The gospel must go to every nation. Those are the 16,000 tribes that live in the world. And then just in case we need clarification, Jesus said in Mark chapter number 16 that we are to preach the gospel to every creature. That is 8 point what? 1 billion people now. 8.1 billion people. You said, but Matt, this all sounds impossible. It would be impossible had God not ordained it to be so, given us the command to do it, and then equip us with the gospel so that it could be done. I think tonight I might embarrass somebody by saying this. I believe that the Great Commission can be and will be fulfilled within our generation. I believe that God has given us the tools. God has given us the money. God has given us the manpower to preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say that everyone will be saved. Notice when Paul preached, it says, and he preached, and when he left, some believed. That's all my responsibility is, is to make sure that people hear, then they can reject or they can believe. I believe in my day, in my generation, the Great Commission can be and will be fulfilled. Jesus commanded it to be so, and I believe that we can do it. No generation on the earth has ever had the resources that we have today to get the job done. When Hudson Taylor left out of China, it took, or left out of England, it took six months to get to China. Today, it, it is 18 hours, 21 hours. And when some of those men did what they did, they were laying down their lives. There was no return. They would lay down their families. They would lose everything. They had no printing presses. They had no ability to go onto the radio. They had no ability to use social media. They had nothing but their voice, and they went and gave their lives. Friend, can I tell you something today? We will be responsible for all that God has given us. There has never been a wealthier nation in the world. There has never been a more technologically advanced nation in the world. It has never been easier ever to fulfill the great commission that Jesus Christ gave. To the uttermost parts, that's every place, to every nation, that is to uh, all of the tribes, and then to every creature, that is individually all of them. Say, so we couldn't do it. We can do it. That's another message for another time because i got to get back to my text or else you think I'm making this up. Here's, notice what it says, verse number 23 of Numbers 32. This is one of the famous verses of the scripture. You've probably heard it declared often. It says, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. You all heard, hear that when you were kids? I, I, I'm, one night, I, I don't know, I must have been poorer than I remember. Because my mom said I got up and dug, I dug the old peanut butter can out of the trash can and dug all of the scraped, uh, I'm eating out of the trash can. And she came in the next day. She said, did you get in the trash last night and eat peanut butter? I said, no. 
She said, I know. What kind of kid would do that? Not the worst thing I ever did. See, God makes some people, they were born missionaries. And she said, be sure your sin will find you out. And it always did. It's true. My youth pastor, my youth pastor, Brother Marvin Smith, boy, he would, he would lay down the law and he'd say, hey, look, if you keep doing that, be sure your sin will find you out. And it did. He's always right. The principle is always true, but what is the context? The context lies in this story. Here is Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. They're on the east side. The east side of the Jordan was beautiful. It was a well-watered place. They said, this is a place for cattle, and we have cattle, and we would like to stay here. So Moses, when you go over the river, or you take the others over the river, Joshua takes them over the river, we are going to stay on the east side. Now, if you'll notice Moses' response to this in verse number 7, Verse number six, Moses says to them, shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? Moses knows what's going to happen on the other side of Jordan. See, they've already been at war some, but they're getting ready to really be in the thick of it. When they cross the Jordan River, they are crossing into enemy territory. And Moses said, it is not fair for you to sit here while your brethren go. You're not going to do that. Notice what Moses says. He begins to give a list. He says in verse number 7, And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over unto the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers. You remember when their fathers did this? Remember 12 men? I haven't had to figure that song out because I only got 10 fingers. 12 men went to spy on Canaan. 10 were bad and 2 were good. See, I got it all wrong again. That's why I don't do children's church anymore. Ten were bad and two were good. So Moses sends the spies in and they go in to spy out the promised land. They come back and they said, it ain't happening. There's, there's giants in that place. We can't go over there. And they discouraged the heart of the people. And you know how the story is going to end. But let's go through what Moses says. He reminds them. He says, verse number seven, you're going to discourage the heart of the people. Can I tell you something, friend? Listen, God has called some of these men to war on foreign soil. And God has called some of us to support them. But not just financially, he's called us to fight with them. That means some of us may go. That means some of us may give our all. That means some of us will do everything that we can to make sure that they have all that they need when they leave this place. Because it's not their war. It's our war. The Great Commission was not given to just a few people. It's given to the church of Jesus Christ. And here we are tonight is what we've done by coming here on a Thursday night is saying, hey, preacher, I won in the war. I'm going to do my best to fight with him. And Moses says, look, if you do not go, you're going to discourage the heart of the people. Let me tell you something. I've been a missionary on the mission field and know when the heart of the churches were not with me. You sense it. It gets lonely there. The phone doesn't ring, the emails don't come, no care packages are there. You call somebody with exciting news or you send out an email and they don't email you back or text you back and you start to feel the stress that, you know what, I don't know that anybody is fighting with me. There is nothing more important to a soldier than to know that somebody has his back, that he is not in there alone. There's a brotherhood that is born among soldiers who fight together. They sense that somebody else is with them. All right, so Moses says, you're going to discourage the people. He not only, he doesn't stop there. He said, thus did your fathers. All right, then number two, in verse number 10, it says this, and the Lord's anger was kindled. You know what happens when you discourage the heart of your missionary brethren? (laughs) The Lord gets upset. Because God has called us to war together. And so God has called Israel over the Jordan. Three tribes said, we don't want to go over the Jordan. He said, this is going to happen again. It happened 40 years ago, nearly. And they discouraged the heart of the people. Then the Lord's anger was kindled against them. And then in number three, look at verse 13. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them to wander. He made them to wander. Can I tell you something? We're living in a generation today that is wandering. 
According to Brother David Gibbs, Christian Law Association, he said 85% of our young people grow up in our churches and leave our movement completely. 85%. I said, that's not true, can't be true. And so I went to the yearbook of the schools that I went to, and I went to the yearbook of the other schools that I would taught at. I went to the yearbooks, and I'm flipping through the pages, and I'm starting to, to make a list of those who are still serving God. And he's right. He's right, right. It was right about 85% are gone. You know what happens when we discourage the heart of the people, when we don't get in the battle with them? You know what happens is people start to wander. They lose purpose. You know what we have to do? We have to replace gospel preaching with entertainment. Hey, we got to keep our kids. What are we going to do to keep our kids? We'll do Xbox tournaments and we'll do basketball tournaments and we'll do pies in the face and we'll do pizza nights and we'll do... I don't even know what people do anymore. Roller skating, that's an 80s thing. What do we do? I don't know. We do everything we can to try to keep them from wandering, but the reason they're wandering is because they're supposed to be at war, but they didn't go to war. The heart of the people got discouraged. The Lord's anger was kindled. And the people are now wandering in the wilderness. And then number four, it says this, and then they were consumed. They're dead. A generation gone. You know why a generation gone? Because they wouldn't go to war. And so now Moses is retelling the story to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh like they didn't know it. Hey, I've been here before. If you guys don't go to Jordan with us, if you don't go over the Jordan, if you don't fight with us, your brethren, they're not going to go either. They're not going without you. We're all going to end up on the east side. We're going to end up wandering in the wilderness while the Lord's anger gets kindled. And then we're going to be consumed and God will raise up another generation to go in. Hey, can I tell you something? If we would all get honest, we would know this, that we're coming out of a lost generation. And I'm afraid we're going to lead another generation to wander again. You hear some of the stories how God used to move, how young people used to surrender their lives. How hippies used to get saved, get right with God, stop doing drugs and drinking and, and, and uh, living immorally. And how God used to just step down in auditoriums and, and people just seemed to just lay everything out before the Lord. And they'd go to the mission field and give everything up. And now we're pulling them back and we're telling the young people, don't do anything crazy. I mean, you, you make sure you have a fallback, get your engineering degree, make sure you get your mortgage paid off, make sure you have everything that you need. For you, what happened to the generation who packed their bags and went and turned the world upside down and didn't have a plan B? But God sent them to war and they gave themselves and the church's heart went with them. Look, there are two issues. I'm saying crazy things. I'm sorry. There are two issues that have hindered me recruiting missionaries in the world. It has not been that young people don't want to do missions. It's their parents and their pastors don't want them to go. So here we are, we're standing up preaching a great commission, we're preaching the word of God, young people's hearts are getting stirred, they're responding in the altars, and the parents and pastors are saying, I hope they don't go. And they're, if they're telling me out loud that, the parents and the pastors are saying out loud, not our kids. What makes you think that your kids are so great that we couldn't possibly send them out? Maybe if they are great, they're the exact ones we ought to be sending out. So what we should be doing is looking at our church and like Acts chapter number 13, praying and fasting and saying, Lord, who would you like us to get out of here? We've got some folks in here that need to, they need to be on the front lines of the war. Everybody's got to be in the war. Somebody needs to be on the front lines. You know what we want to send? We want to send the troublemakers. We want to send the people who, who flunked out, got kicked out, you know? We want to send the people who, who don't really do anything here. But what we should be doing is taking our best and brightest. Have you ever seen a military operation? We have what we call special operators. You know what we do? We pour everything into them so that they go behind the lines and they inflict maximum damage on the enemy. They are sharp dudes. Way sharper than me. I mean, their IQs are high, their, ability, their strength, their endurance, their agility. And we send them, you say, well, they could have been doctors, they could have been. No, we send them to war because we've got to have the guys on the front lines getting the work done. 
got off course. Here's what Moses says. You'll discourage the heart of the people. He said, the Lord's anger is going to be kindled. And then he says, they're going to wander. Be careful that you don't live in a wandering church, in a wandering generation. And he said this, they'll be consumed. And it's kind of like Esther. It's almost like God will raise up another generation or, or deliverance from another place. Great Commission has been granted to us, and this is our day. But friend, can I tell you something? If the independent Baptists in America aren't going to get it done, you watch God raise up other people. I'm, ba I'm Baptist. I'm not evangelical. I'm Baptist. But let me tell you what. I'm looking at North Africa. I'm looking at the Middle East, and we're not there. Other guys are there. And they're putting us to shame. So here's what's going to happen. Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh with this rebuke. They say something like this. Well, let's look at verse number 14. Moses says to them, he finishes these four points, and he says, And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, instead uh, oh, an increase of sinful men to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord towards Israel. For if ye turn away from after him, he will yet again leave them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all those people. Who's going to destroy the people? Ye. Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. He said, this is your generation. And you will destroy this generation. Why? Because they don't want to fight with them. So, verse number 17. Verse 16. And they came near unto him and said... We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them unto their place. And our little ones shall dwell in fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. Reuben Gad Manasseh, after that great rebuke, said, Yes, sir, we're fight." We'll leave our kids here, but we're going over. And we will not come back until it is finished. Then, Moses says, verse number 23, But if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Now we have context for one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It's not about stealing peanut butter. Not about listening to rock music. We make application. But the interpretation of this verse is men who were unwilling to engage when their brethren were at war. And he said, be sure your sin will find you. He said, what does that look like for a saved person? Well, Obviously, there is a judgment seat for those who are lost. That's a great white throne of judgment. That's a judgment seat. I'll never, I'll never be at that judgment seat. When I was saved, my sins were forgiven, been washed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus, not have to worry about standing in judgment on my sin. But I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 10. So I'll stand at that judgment seat, and when I stand at that judgment seat, I long for the words, well done thou good and faithful and we all do and probably tonight if we took a poll and I said how many of you think you're going to hear well done probably most of our hands would go up I attend church three times a week and I gave my offerings and I but can I tell you something be sure your sin will find you out it might be that the sin that finds you out of the judgment seat is not a sin of commission something you did but something you left undone when you should have went to war with your brethren you did not go and it could be that when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, in that instant when you take your last breath here, your first breath there, and you appear in the presence of God, the Bible says that you're going to, it says we must. That's a pretty bold statement. All appear. That's a very intimate statement. At the judgment seat of Christ. And you say, I can't wait for that moment. He's going to say, well done. What if he looks at us and says, why didn't you go to war? Why didn't you go to war with those guys? I mean, you put $100 in? 
You put $1,000 in, but your heart didn't go. Can I tell you something? I'll speak for the rest of missionaries tonight. We need your whole heart. Your money will follow your heart, not worried about the money. I've been at this 25 years, not ever worried about the money. But if your heart goes with these guys, if your heart goes with them, if you weep with them, if you pray for them, if you visit them, if you encourage them, if you do at home what they do there, then you go to war with them. You know, we'll send missionaries to do gospel ministry in the hardest parts of the world, and yet we won't tell anybody here where it's easier than it is anywhere else in the world. We're not at war with them. And it becomes obvious. He says, be sure your sin will find you out. Now, here's what he asked of them. Verse number 29, he speaks to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, and Moses said unto them, if the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass, I keep mentioning Manasseh because Manasseh is in here. He doesn't say Manasseh every time, but Manasseh is listed among the three. Moses said unto them, if the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass with you over Jordan, every man armed to battle before the Lord, and the land shall be subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. So Moses rebukes these three tribes. They repent and say, we will fight with them. And he said, if you don't, be sure your sin will find you out. Now he turns to the other tribes and he says, I've made a bargain. I struck a deal with Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. And he gives a list of three things that they're going to do. First of all, he says, they will pass over with you. They will share in the responsibility. They will pass over with you. Can I tell you something tonight? It is not that we're going to send missionaries out to do their job. It's that we are in essence, going with these missionaries to do their job. You say, well, I'm not physically there. You're not physically there, but you're spiritually there. You're committed. You're 100% in. And if God were to touch your heart, you would be right there. And if God touches the heart of your children to go with them, you'll rejoice in that. See, because you committed to be all in, he will go with us. They'll pass over with us. They're sharing the responsibility. And I'm telling you something, friend, I've been at this a little while, and here's what I'm finding. Churches will take and shirk their responsibility by giving you an offering. You know, we don't want any part of that, Brother Matt. It sounds a little bit crazy. Here's 500 bucks. That'll help you get it done. That's not what we're asking. We're asking for you to go over with us. You can't all go physically, but your heart can go. When our heart breaks on the mission field, your heart has to break here. You have to go with us. It's a shared responsibility. The second thing he says there in verse number 29 is that you go armed for battle, a shared risk. Shared risk. I, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, you guys better get your swords, get your spears, and put your helmets on because we are going to war. What has it cost us to fulfill the Great Commission? Lynn Ravenhill said one time, he said that one of the saddest things I can think of is that we live in a dying church, or no, a selfish church in a dying world. A selfish church in a dying world. What risk have we taken so that everyone can hear? Our missionaries take the risk. We'll be in, we, I've been in jail in two countries. Be wonderful experience. Food poisoning. Houses broken into, car accidents. Our missionaries are taking these extraordinary risks. And you say, yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm not in on that. I'm not with these guys. I'm not in on the risk. Moses says, if you don't risk with us, you discourage the heart of the people. The Lord's anger gets kindled. The people have to wander in the wilderness, and ultimately the people are consumed. And you will be responsible for destroying the people. He said, you're going to pass over with us, and you're taking your weapons. You share the risk. I will not ask Brother George to go and do something that I will not risk to help him do. If he's risking, I'm risking with him. He's sacrificing, I'm sacrificing with him. When they're selling their homes, I'm selling things too. You say, Brother Matt, what does that mean exactly? I don't know. You ask the Holy Ghost what that means. I'm just saying you can't set by while the brethren go to war and not fight with them. You can't do that. Not an option. 
So they share the risk, they share the responsibility, but notice this in the end of verse number 29, he says, then you shall give them the land. Can I tell you something? It's really crazy. Moses gives them what they wanted. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the things that you're afraid to give to God, when you finally give to God, God gives you something better or God gives you back what you gave? It's really interesting. I, I Man, I gave my children to the Lord. I, 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 in my mind, I laid in an altar one night and I called out their names. I said, Lord, they can, they can live long, prosperous lives or you can, you can shorten their lives if that's what you want. They can be healthy or, or they could be sickly. They can be rich or they can be poor. They can live next to me or they can live in the darkest place of the world. They no longer belong to me. I give them to the Lord. And that's a terrifying thought. And then you know what the Lord let us do last year is to hire both my boys, Nathan and Caleb, and they worked with me for an entire year, sat in my office every day right there next to them. They had lunch with us at our table at our house every day. I said, Lord, it's pretty crazy. That's a dream come true for me. The Lord gave me more than I asked for, more than I wanted. But I tell you something, you know what we're responsible to do is to give our everything to the Lord. But the Lord gave them what they wanted. You know how that happens sometimes? As God changed what you want. He just changes your heart. Say, so, well, when I, if I give it to the Lord, how do I know he's going to give it back? You don't. But what he does give you, you'll be excited about. Because our hearts change. He changes my heart. My wife and I have gone through two or three major ministry changes the last 25 years. And every time we did, we stepped into it very cautiously. Lord, we don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. And when we got into it, we thought, Lord, this is really cool. You say, did it get better? No, our hearts changed. Our hearts changed. They shared the risk. They went over together. They shared the, or they shared the responsibility. They went over together. They shared the risk. They all went armed and ready to fight. And they shared the reward. They got the land that they asked for in the first place, but they didn't get it without a fight. Let me give you a quick illustration tonight. I'll be finished with this. Think about this tonight. When we think about the subject of war, the fulfillment of the Great Commission, we go back a little bit of time past to think about what happened in World War II. In 1939, you know, the Nazis invaded Poland. I think it was like September 19th, something like that. And we didn't care. I mean, who cared about Poland? Although the pastor I preached for last Sunday night was from Poland, and he's like, mm, you know, I do. Who, who cares about Poland? Well, all of a sudden, December 7, 1941, when Pearl Harbor is attacked, all of a sudden, the heart of America changed. And you know what happened in World War II? Why Tom Brokaw said it was the greatest generation? Here's why. is because when the war cry sounded, they all went to war. It was all in. Very few draft dodgers World War II. You know, by 8 or 9 o'clock on, on Sunday morning when Pearl Harbor was struck, which over here on the mainland would have been later in the, the day, in the afternoon, within just a few hours that the recruiting stations had lined, wrapped around the block, hundreds of men stood in line to, to enlist. Something like 23% of them were rejected because they had just come out of the Great Depression and they were not fit for war something like 23%. And those who were rejected went away depressed. The suicide rate among them was high. Why? Because they wanted to be at war with their brethren. We had over 3,000 men killed at Pearl Harbor. And the rest of America said, we'll not stand for that. We'll put our own lives on the line. And any time you get any somebody from that generation and you ask them, they'll begin to tell you story after story. One of my neighbors, I asked him, I said, where were you in the war? And he started to cry. He said, I was only seven years old. But he said, my dad was on the back of a ship fighting, shooting down Japanese Zeros. He said, one of the Zeros got past and struck their ship. They came into San Francisco for repairs. He said, he got a telegram that said, your dad is in San Francisco. And he said, me and my mom went to St. Louis, jumped on a train and rode two and a half days and got to San Francisco to see my dad. I asked one of the old ladies in my church, I said, where were you in the war? And she said, I... I was only, you know, five or six years old, but she said I had three brothers on the ships in the Pacific. And she said every night my mom cried herself to sleep, calling out their names in prayer that God would protect them. And he did. Everyone has a story like that. I asked my wife's dad. I said, I said, where was your dad in the war? He said, well, he had a bad back. They wouldn't take him. He said, so they sent him down to the St. Louis, down to the docks at the train station. And he loaded trains for 12 hours a day. His back was too bad to fight. And he loaded trains all day long. 
My grandfather went in, crossed the Rhine, built bridges, freed the, uh, freed the concentration camps. Kathy's other grandfather uh, landed on Normandy, fought his way through France. And every school teacher and every school kid and every doctor and every lawyer and every parent and everyone prayed and everyone fought. They recycled everything they could get their hands on to turn it into weapons. They not only recycled, but they rationed everything. You couldn't buy a gallon of gasoline without a ration card or a cube of sugar. They rationed everything. Why? There's a war on. Have you ever, not, you ever seen a, a 40s movie with Bing Crosby or anybody in it? And they always said, don't you know there's a war on? We can't buy tires. Can't buy sugar. There's a war on. Friend, can I tell you something tonight? Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ has rejected a wartime mentality. The truth is this, we have chosen to live in a world of pleasure beyond anything the world has ever had, and we've looked at the war and said, not our fight. But it is our fight. So when those men came home, my grandfather said, man, when they sailed over to Germany, he said, it was a tough deal. But he said, when we sailed back from Germany, he said, we was on Hitler's private yacht, and we ate caviar all the way back. And when they came into New York, he said tens of thousands of people were on the streets celebrating their return. There's another war recently. I've seen a shirt here already represented Vietnam. Was there a difference? Yes, you know the difference, but let me illustrate it anyways. We sent our young men to die in the jungles of Vietnam, and we did not go with them. When they returned, we called them names, urinated on them, struck them, spit on them. And up until a few years ago, it's changed now, but up until a few years ago, you would be all through St. Louis at stoplights and different park benches, and you would see a sign, Vietnam Vet, right? They came back broken. We sent a generation to war without our heart. Oh, we sent them, we gave them bullets, we gave them food, but our heart was not there. You see, there's a great difference between the greatest generation and the Vietnam generation. And it wasn't the quality of the soldier. It wasn't even the quality of the mission. It was those who sent them. What Moses is saying is we might be able to do it without you. But we're not going to do it without you. We're going to cross Jordan and you're going to cross Jordan with us. Shall ye sit here and your brethren go to war? Be sure your sin will find you out. Say, Brother Matt, what does this mean? I don't know what it means for you. Here's what it means for me. Is in every possible way, my heart goes with these men, their families, in every possible way. That is financially. I will give until it hurts. I will sell the things that I can and give that. I will do without the things that I want, and I will send those finances. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, because then I can encourage them. You go back to World War II, and you begin to study like the, the USO. You look at Bob Hope or something like that. Bob Hope didn't fight in the war. He entertained the troops. He brought them courage and hope. There is always somebody, you say, Brother Matt, I don't have a lot to give. All right, don't worry about giving what you don't have. Give what you do have. Participate in the war. Be an encouragement. Whatever you do, your industry, your field, your career, your hobby, somehow it plays a part in this war. You have a role to play. You can play that role in giving. You can do it in prayer. You can do it in encouragement. You can do it by visiting. And you can do it in restoration. I love the, the, the antique shops. You go in and you'll find those World War II posters. And, and man, they, they make it so appealing. I want to enlist. The war's been over 75 years. I still want to enlist and fight. You see those pictures of Uncle Sam and you see those pictures of those soldiers in the trenches. One of my favorite is you'll see the Red Cross recruiting posters. And it will have this lady in this beautiful white dress. She'll have a blue coat on, that little white hat with the red cross on it. She's walking through a battlefield. There's death and mayhem all around her, but she's standing tall and proud. She's strutting through there, and she's got her hand reached out to a soldier who looks like he's on death's door, and it says, do your part, join the red cross. And I think, man, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't do that? 
And maybe you say, Brother Matt, I don't have the resources that others have. But you can take a hurting missionary and bring them to the place of restoration. It's incredible. We get a missionary who comes back from the field and they get a little discouraged. And instead of rebuilding them and, and encouraging them and ministering to them, we find fault in them so we can drop them and send their $50 to somebody else. What kind of craziness is that? They are indispensable. They're indispensable, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, to bring them back to spiritual, physical, mental, emotional health. We minister to them. And part of the conference that we're in this week is not just to raise money, it's to minister to the missionary. It's to make sure that they're whole, so that as we deploy them, that they do maximum damage in the enemy's territory. Why? Because there's a war on the Great Commission to the uttermost parts, to every nation, to every creature. A friend of mine called me the other day and he said, Brother Matt, he said, I, I think you're right. And he coined this term and I steal it. He said, I think we're in the Vietnam of missions. He said, our guys are discouraged. They're hurting. He said, they're getting the paychecks, but they don't have the support of the churches. When is the last time you wept over your missionaries? When is the last time you called out their children's names? Do we know their children's names? When was the last time that your heart went all the way with them? So, but man, I thought we were going to talk about money. The money follows the heart. The money follows the heart. If we got your money, but we didn't get your heart, it would fade. We'd have to pump you back up next week, you know? Come on, folks, you committed to give, and now I, we don't have to do that. When your heart follows this idea of the Great Commission, and we invest completely. Say, so how do I respond to that? Well, the Holy Ghost has a great way of showing us how to respond. There might be something you've been holding on to. You say, well, no, this is my hobby. This is my thing. This is the way I live. This is, why don't you lay it at the altar and say, Lord, what would you like to do with it? I love to give. Some preachers don't like to preach on giving. I love to preach on giving because I love to give. It's my favorite hobby. I give sometimes so much that I don't have anything left to give. I give away other people's stuff. I called my pastor one time. I said, hey, you got two cars? He said, yeah. I said, can I give one away? He said, yeah. Gave it away. Brother Dover's brother, actually. Brother Jason. I love to give. I love to give not so I can be rewarded. I love to give because I want to participate. I sure don't want to stand up at the end of my life and say, man, there was a war on and I didn't even, I didn't get in. I want in. However I can. You can give. You can pray. You can go. You can restore. But you can't remain neutral can't because your sin will find you out let's have a word of prayer father thank you tonight for the word of god thank you lord i believe that you speak through your word not through the intellect of man not through the ability of man and so god there's no faith tonight in, in me or in this church itself but lord in your word this has got to be a powerful thought a powerful lesson god you put this here not so that we understand the history but so that we can see the principle that, Lord, as a, as a united front, God, that, that we are called to go to war together. Lord, I pray you'd speak to your people, that you would glorify Christ in Jesus' name.